Good morning, and welcome to another Sunday morning e-service broadcast here at Grace and Truth Apostolic Ministries, who we affectionately refer to as GTAM. I want to also take a moment to welcome those of you all that may be uh, watching and joining us for the very first time. We're certainly glad to have you here with us today and pray that even through this uh, virtual platform that you feel uh, that you feel welcomed uh, and uh, an important part of our service experience today. I also want to take a moment to wish a happy Father's Day uh, to all of the fathers out there. Uh, as the uh, proud father myself of seven wonderful children, I know the great joy and blessing uh, that comes from uh, being given the opportunity to, to be a father to God's creation, to his children. So a uh, happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there. And I pray that uh, that you all are celebrating your fathers in whatever ways uh, that you can, whether that's in person or virtually. Uh, also, uh, I understand the experience of one who has lost their father and, and some uh, are filled with uh, different emotions on this day as they reflect and ponder uh, those fathers who are no longer with them. And I'd like to share with you how I have approached this, uh, this day uh, the last couple years now uh, without my father being with us. And I, I've not experienced the, the sorrow that, that some have. Instead, I use this as an opportunity to think of all of the different uh, life lessons that my father imparted to me, some of the great memories that we've uh, shared throughout uh, our lifetime together, and, and some of those things that just bring a smile uh, to my face, some of his sayings and, and things of that nature. So today is a day of remembrance for me uh, with my father not being here and, and fond memories uh, for sure. And, and I would encourage you all to do the same on this day. If your father's not uh, here with you any longer, uh, you know, take a moment to just ponder and reflect on, on all the good times, all the memories, the many life lessons and uh, maybe even visit uh, those with with others uh, in your family, other siblings that you may have, or if your your mom is still around, you know, share it with your mom as well. Hopefully, that'll bring a smile to you uh, on this day as well. Typically, this time of year, we're also celebrating graduates, and uh, our ministry loves to. Uh, celebrate the accomplishments of, of those who have graduated and these key milestones in their lives. And obviously with the uh, uh, coronavirus and COVID-19 circumstance, uh, that's going to be a little bit different this year, but we still want to acknowledge uh, and celebrate uh, all of our grads out there, whether you're graduating from high school or college, vocational school, uh, whether you're a traditional student or a non-traditional student like myself, I often joke that I was on a 20-year plan. I started college in 1986 and graduated in 2006. It took me 20 years uh, to graduate, but I did. So I just called myself a non-traditional student. So, so whether you're a traditional or non-traditional student, no matter what level uh, you're graduating from or certifications, vocational programs that you may be completing, we want to celebrate that milestone in your life. So uh, please uh, contact us through um, the church uh, email address, admin at apostolicdoctrine.com and share with us uh, information about your graduate, a picture uh, if you have one. I believe uh, here in a moment, you're probably gonna also see some more information on, on how to get that to us. And uh, we're gonna celebrate you and we'll share some more information with you on exactly how to do that. Uh, and lastly, before we have a word of prayer and, and continue on in our service experience today, uh, as many of you all may have heard, King County uh, on Friday entered into um, phase two, uh, which does uh, open up some opportunities for us to do some in-service um, activities uh, as, a, as a church, as a faith-based organization. So we are working uh, with our leadership team and, and starting to plan on exactly what that's gonna look like. So stay tuned uh, for more information to come on that, okay? And so with that, I'm just gonna invite you to join us uh, in a word of prayer before we continue on with uh, some additional information. And I'll be back with you in a few moments with the message for today, okay? So will you join us in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you so much for uh, this opportunity 
that you have established and afforded for us to come together, even in this virtual environment, to uh, share in each other's company uh, through these chats and to receive your word through these messages. And I'm praying, Lord, that you would be in the midst of us throughout our time gathered together today. Uh, certainly, Lord, we want to honor and celebrate all of the fathers that are out there and just pl- pray that your hand of blessing would continue to be upon them, uh, that you would feed us all with your knowledge and your wisdom so that we can parent our children in the spirit and manner uh, that will honor and bless you. Lord, I pray for the continued comfort of those who have lost their fathers today and that today will be a time to reflect and and ponder and, and revisit some of the, the many joys and, and treasure times that uh, we uh, have had in the past with our fathers who are no longer with us. So, Lord, we just, again, thank you for your presence being here with us, even in this virtual service format, and just look forward to how you're going to continue to manifest yourself during our time together today. God bless you. We love you. In Jesus' name, we say amen. All right, so God bless you. I'll be back with you in just a couple moments here to uh, get into the Word. Welcome back. You know, as we navigate our way through this very unique time in human history that we are living, I believe that it is uh, crucially uh, important, imperative, uh, that the church really operates in the way that God intended. If at any other time in our lifetimes does the church need to really represent God. It's in times such as these. And that is in part why I am really uh, thankful that uh, I've been inspired to start this ministerial series on the church to help us better understand um, what the church is, what the church is not, uh, what did God intend for the church? What is the church supposed to be about so that we can operate with maximum effectiveness? The more effective we are in doing what it is that God has purposed us to do as a body of believers, as the gathering of those who have answered his call, the greater impact we'll be able to have on the world in which we live. So I pray that the things that we have shared in this ministerial series so far, and those things that we have in store to continue sharing with you are both informing you as well as empowering you to to be the church and have an impact on the world around you, to be that salt that still has its savor, to be that light, that beacon that is set upon a hill that cannot be hid. And so with that in mind, I'm going to again invite you to join us 
uh, in a brief word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into the message today. All right. Lord, we thank you again for this opportunity to come and to educate, engage, and empower your body to be everything that you have called and equipped us to be. I'm praying that those things that we are going to share today will not only enlighten us, but they will also position us to move forward uh, in the manner and way that you have intended and prescribed for us. And that Lord, as a result of that, we will see an impact uh, on the world that we are a part of. Lord, I pray that everyone that is listening to this message, uh, each and every one of their hearts and their minds will be open, tender, receptive, ready to receive and embrace the truths that you are going to share with us today. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for speaking these truths into our lives. In Jesus' name, we say amen. And so with that, GTAM, are you ready for the word? Word up. Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles uh, with me to the book of Acts. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the latter portion of Acts, the second chapter. And as you all are turning in your Bibles there, navigating your way there through your respective electronic device, I'm just going to set the stage for you and give you a little bit of context uh, into what's going on. And then we're going to dive into the substance of a few verses of scripture again towards the latter end of Acts, the second chapter. So we find ourselves at a time uh, after Jesus's uh, resurrection uh, and his ascension that he sends the disciples um, to Jerusalem to wait for the promise of the Father. And the promise specifically being referred to here is the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so there were the 11 remaining disciples, because once again, Judas Iscariot has betrayed Christ and has uh, hung himself uh, in remorse for those acts. So, so the uh, 12 disciples have now been reduced to 11, uh, and they're beginning to do the work in which they were commissioned to do. Uh, to preach the gospel to, to every creature and embark upon their apostolic uh, mission. And so they're in this, they've gathered together in this small upper room in Jerusalem. It's the 11 uh, foundational disciples, uh, as well as about a total of 120 people that had all gathered together in this small upper room. And it's in this environment, really the first gathering of the church. And, and it's important to note that, right? If you really want to understand what the original intent and purpose of any organization is, go to how it started. And so we're looking at how the church started uh, in this small upper room with about 120 individuals um, under the leadership of the 11 foundational uh, disciples, soon to be apostles. And so we see the end of uh, the first chapter of the book of Acts uh, coming to a close with uh, them casting lots, uh, basically voting uh, in a bit of a random manner to determine who was going to replace Judas uh, as the 12th foundational apostle. Um, we know that that ended up being Matthias. Uh, Matthias was the apostle that the men uh, of that day chose. But of course, as we read on in the book of Acts, we see that the apostle that Christ had in mind uh, was actually Saul of Tarsus, who would uh, later be renamed to the apostle Paul. And so that's how the first chapter of the book of Acts ends. And the second chapter begins uh, on the day of Pentecost, right? They were, the Bible describes, all with one accord, meaning that they were all on the same page. They were all gathered together in unity. And this is going to be a theme that we're going to see continued on uh, as we uh, uh, advance our study into the latter portion of the second chapter of Acts, they were all with one accord. So they were uh, singleness of heart, singleness of mind, singleness of purpose. They were all with one accord and they had assembled or gathered together in this one place. Again, this small upper room uh, when there was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
And uh, the manifestation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was uh, they began to speak with other tongues. And there were people there that uh, were not experiencing this because they weren't a part of the church at that point. They weren't uh, those who God had called and had answered the call. So the Holy Spirit was not poured upon them. It was only poured upon those 120 in the upper room. So those that uh, were in the proximity of this event taking place heard this. They, they heard these 120 people speaking in these uh, unlearned, unknown languages. And they surmise and suppose that those individuals were intoxicated, that they were drunk. And so Peter, as you will recall, who Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to, uh, it was also uh, Peter who acknowledged and recognized uh, who Jesus was and that that was going that revelation of who Jesus was rather was going to be the foundation of the church. It was that same Peter who appropriately again, because we're looking at the the beginning, the launch, as it were, of the first church. So it's appropriate that Peter uh, would be the messenger. He would speak the first message. He would preach the first sermon, as it were, of the church. And, and his sermon was intended to address a misrepresentation uh, of what was going on in the church by those who were outside of the church. And so he began to, to speak and articulate to that group of individuals who had uh, gathered outside of the church, he began to speak to them uh, the principles of Christ. Uh, and when he got to the end of his sermon, um, the, 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 those that were in the audience, those that were in uh, the, the company of the original churchgoers were pricked, the Bible says, in their hearts by the message of Peter. And that's the goal of, of every uh, pastoral leader, of every evangelist, of every uh, presenter of the gospel is to prick the hearts of those that are outside of the church, right? To, to compel them uh, in such a way that they will respond like these uh, uh, first century non-believers did. Because again, these were those who were non-believers. They were unchurched. Uh, as it were. And, and as a result of them hearing the message of Christ, they were pricked in their heart and responded to Peter saying, men and brethren, what shall we do? What, what do we need to do to, to right the wrong of our condition and of the circumstances that we find ourselves in? And so Peter uh, said unto them to repent and to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and that they would be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. He articulated to them that that promise of the Holy Spirit was to them and to their children and to all that were afar off as many as the Lord our God shall call, right? And so this takes us to verse number 40 of the second chapter of Acts. And it says, and with many other words did he, talking about Peter, testify and exhort, which is to uh, speak words of instruction and encouragement, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation, right? This ungodly and, and really um, out of alignment with the will of God generation. Then watch this verse number 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. So again, understand the context of this. So there's about 120 people gathered in this small upper room, uh, all on one accord, you know, worshiping, celebrating, loving God, having fellowship with one another. And in the midst of that experience, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. And there was a crowd of people that had gathered around them uh, that didn't understand what was going on. Right. So so that's who Peter was speaking to. He was speaking to this crowd of people that had gathered around. And some, many, as a matter of fact, in that crowd uh, were pricked by the message of Peter and responded, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter gave them that instruction. And you see here in verse number 40, that of that group that was there that gladly received his word, uh, and there's an implication here is that not everybody received it. Some did, 
but not all. And that is the case whenever you're going to be placed in a position to minister to the unchurched, to those who may not believe in the principles of the faith like we do, not everyone is going to gladly receive that word. Amen. But there is a group of those that are a part of the community of unbelievers that are going to be very receptive and welcoming of the gospel message of Christ. And as many that gladly received his word, not begrudgingly, not a group of people that had to be sold, not a group of people that needed the pomp and the circumstance, but these were individuals who the uh, hearts were tender uh, and, and receptive and ready to have a committed and meaningful relationship with Christ. Amen. So, so, uh, uh, those that gladly received his word were baptized. Amen. Uh, and the same day there were added unto them. So again, who's the them that were added unto? It was those 120 individuals that had gathered in a small upper room. It was the early members, as it were, of the church, right? And so added to that community, those who heard and responded to the call of Christ and uh, those who heard and responded to the call of Christ uh, and, and those who uh, assembled themselves together, they were added unto them in that single day, in that single experience, uh, about 3,000 souls. So you see that the size of the church, the size of the assembly grew instantaneously from about 120 people to over 3,000 in a day, right? Now, I'm going to spend a few minutes on verse number 42 because, again, this gets into some of the foundational elements of the early church, right? What was the early church all about and 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 I've got to uh, confess to you that in my study uh, of this, I have really been refreshed at just how simple things were for the early church. That that it wasn't overly complicated, uh, and and just the spirit and the heart at which in, in which they went about things. And I think we're going to see some of that here uh, over these next several verses. It says in verse number 42, and they continued steadfastly, right? And, and so that term steadfastly means uh, with some sense of, of diligence, some sense of consistency, with, with faithfulness, uh, undeterred as it were. They continued steadfastly, faithfully, right? And watch this. There's four distinct things uh, that Luke shares with us that were indicative of the early church, of the first church, right? They continue steadfastly in one, the apostles' doctrine, and in two, fellowship, in three, the breaking of bread, and in four, prayers, amen? And so when it talks about they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, it's talking about the teaching and the instruction of, of the apostles. And what's important to note here is that the apostles, right, those those foundational 11 apostles spent three and a half years living day in and day out with Jesus, being instructed and having things imparted to him to them. They were trained and mentored by the Messiah himself. So you can look at it this way, that there was an impartation and a download from Christ into the apostles, equipping them and preparing them to lead the church. And so they turned around and shared that knowledge, that understanding, that information, the way of Christ with others. So that was a key foundational element of the early church. It was a church that spent time teaching 
and instructing. They spent time developing, mentoring, making disciples of those that had gladly received his word and had committed themselves to the church, right? And, and think about this. This makes sense. There were over 3,000 people that were unchurched, over 3,000 people that were non-believers that were stepping into a new way of life. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to conduct and carry themselves. They didn't understand uh, the way to think about certain things and, and how to approach certain things and how to conduct themselves. They needed to be trained. They needed to be taught. They needed to be instructed. And they came with an appetite ready to receive that. Amen. They didn't come in thinking that they knew everything and had all the answers. They came in as unbelievers and unchurched saying, hey, I need to be taught. I need to be instructed. And the apostle said, let me share and impart to you that which we have received of Christ. So one of the key elements of the first church was teaching and instruction and the making of disciples. Amen. And they continued faithfully, continually in this. This was a part of just how they conducted themselves and how they administered the church. They were constantly teaching and instructing. Amen. They continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship, right? Now, in an earlier service broadcast, we gave you the Greek term for church being ecclesia. Uh, well, there's another important Greek term uh, that I'm gonna share with you today for uh, fellowship, and that's koinonia, right? And that term koinonia comes from the concept of community, right? Those things that cause us to come together and share in each other's company, share in each other's experience, right? To draw strength from one another, right? To share in the resources that each other has. Sometimes those resources may be natural, life-sustaining uh, type of resources, and in other cases, it may be informational resources, network connections, and, and things of that nature. It was very, very common in those days for uh, 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 individual to go to a company or a community of believers in another town, in another uh, city, uh, but to go with the endorsement of someone that they knew and that was familiar with the city that they came to. That was a part of the community. I want you to greet. I want you to entreat. I want you to receive this brother or this sister or this family that's coming into your community. I want you to receive them. I'm going to endorse them. That was a part of the element or aspect of koinonia, of community, of fellowship, of getting together with one another. We're going to see some of that playing out here uh, in scripture. So when you talk about the, the dynamics of the early church, of the first century church, right, of that foundational church that was started uh, on the day of Pentecost, you'll see that being in fellowship with one another was a key element of that, something that they continued in steadfastly, all right? So, so, so there was clearly two forms of, of gatherings and worship, right? The Bible talks about temple worship. This is the more formal, structured worship uh, that we see being carried out predominantly by those that were of a Hebrew or Jewish descent. Because again, later on in these very early days, you don't see uh, Gentiles, those who were born outside of the Hebrew lineage, you don't see Gentiles being uh, grafted into the very, very early days of the church. It's, it's not until uh, sometime later in the book of Acts uh, where really we see Cornelius in his house uh, receiving the gospel that Gentiles are grafted in. So temple worship in the very early days of the church was predominantly uh, customs and traditional uh, formal structure worship carried out by those that were a part of the Hebrew community. Gentiles weren't necessarily a part of that. Uh, and, and so there's the temple worship, but then there's also just the activity outside of the temple of that first century church, which again included 
uh, being instructed, taught on the apostles' doctrine uh, and this fellowship, right? This this going from house to house and and spending time with each other in a very personal way, getting to know one another and, and reaching beyond just those dynamics of your own familial uh, circumstances. And this was critically important uh, amongst the, the first century believers in large part because in order to be a part of the Christian community, it costs uh, it caused you to be ostracized from your family, right? Uh, many people saw uh, Christianity in the early days as another sect, as almost a cult uh, of that time. And, and they saw it as an offense and a departure away from Judaism. So if you had a family member that embraced the ways of Christianity, many times you would be disowned from your family. You would be excommunicated, as it were, from your community and from the circle that you had grown up uh, as a part of. And so all of the support associated with that community that you were once a part of would be severed as well because of your commitment to Christ. So, so your commitment to Christ really cost you something. And, and so it was really important then that you were embraced and brought in by this new community. Many times these people didn't have places to stay. Uh, they didn't have food to eat and, and things of this nature. So, so you'll see that they, they were really communal in that sense and they shared everything because again, those that were gladly receiving the word of God and coming into the, the, the church community, uh, they were really making a significant and serious commitment uh, in their lives, many times at great peril and natural expense. So, so you see that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, this, this idea of community, right? They also continued steadfastly in breaking of bread. And, and, and I want to, to try to spend just a couple minutes uh, uh, giving some more insight into what this is, because this is really talking about the sacrament of the church. This is not the breaking of bread in terms of, of uh, sharing any, sharing meals with one another, although that was something that was uh, shared and enjoyed by the first century church. And we're going to see that here in just a few moments as we read further into Acts, the second chapter. Uh, but the uh, this breaking of bread being spoken of here is really referring to more specifically the Lord's Supper, right? And, and the Passover meal. And so they continued uh, conducting and carrying out the sacraments of the church. So, so the sacraments of the church are those religious, those spiritual uh, acts of the church. And so these are things like um, again, the Lord's Supper or communion, uh, baptisms, those things that those who have been uh, trained and ordained in ministry, those duties that they conduct, right? So uh, 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 administering and officiating over weddings and, and funerals and things of that nature. These are the sacraments, the, the sacred or religious duties of the church, right? Uh, those things were conducted as a part of the early church. So they continued steadfastly in the doctrine, instruction, and teaching of the apostles. They continue steadfastly in koinonia, right, in fellowship and in sharing a company and resources uh, with one another, right? They continue steadfastly in the breaking of bread. And so the, the continuation of those sacred uh, religious acts of the church, right? And then lastly, they continue steadfastly in prayer, right? So, so prayer uh, in this context is, is really being connected with God through times of meditation, through times of study of the word, uh, through times of worship and celebration, right? So when we're talking about prayer in this context, it's not only talking about they continued in corporate or communal prayer, right? But it also refers to that personal private prayer that they continued in. So these were some of the things that were indicative 
of the early church. You had a group of people who were united on one accord, who regularly came into the same space with one another, right? And when they did come together, when they did assemble together, they would come together for the purpose of being taught and instructed, mentored, discipled in the way and the word of God. They continued to enjoy each other's fellowship and to share community uh, and resources with one another. They continue to carry out the, the sacred uh, sacraments of, of the church, the baptisms, the, 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 the uh, uh, sharing of the Lord's Supper and communion and, and the bringing together in holy matrimony, husbands and wives, and, and being there to lay people to rest at the end of their days upon the earth, right? And then they continue steadfastly also in prayer, in their own personal and private devotions, as well as coming together uh, and sharing testimonies and communal prayers. And, and you can just imagine just how beautiful of an environment and a setting and, and how uh, simple uh, the early church environment was. And now take a look at what the fruit of that was. What, what did that produce, right? We look at verse number 43. It says, and fear came upon every soul. And again, the fear here is not dread or terror, right? But it's a certain reverence. It was a respect, a value, and appreciation came upon every soul. They appreciated the community that they were a part of. They appreciated the God that they were serving. They appreciated and valued the apostles' doctrine and the discipleship, uh, the mentoring, the training that they were receiving. There, there was a certain reverence and an appreciation of value that came upon every soul that was a part of this community, right? And as a result of that, there were many wonders and many signs done by the apostles. And it's no surprise that that was the case. Can you imagine being in an environment where there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and people are all with one accord, they're all in one place, they all are of the same mind and of the same judgments and working towards the same agendas and they're being mentored and, and trained and being developed and, and, and they're sharing fellowship and building meaningful, substantive relationships with one another and, and the, the sacred duties and responsibilities of the church are being fulfilled and satisfied and they're observing that, they're witnessing that, they're a part of that, they're participating in that, they're spending time in their own personal prayer and devotion and connecting with God. They're coming together as a collective body in prayer and worship and in, in celebration of the, the, the move and manifestation of God. And, and there's this profound and deep respect and appreciation for God and the things of God and the people of God. It's no wonder that in an environment like that, that's uh, free of pretense and pomp and circumstance and and, and all of, of that other stuff. It's no wonder that you see these great moves of God and these great signs and wonders that are being done at the hands of the apostles. And look at verse number 44. It says, and all that believed were together. So again, everyone that gladly received his word are those that came together. You, you, you notice that everyone in that audience received the same message, was exposed to the same experience, but not everybody responded to it the same way. There was certainly a group of those that gladly received it. And, and they, they had all things uh, common and they came together, but that certainly was not all of them. There was a segment of that group as well that I'm sure departed and went to their own respective homes and continued life as they'd known it beforehand, right? Uh, and so all that believed are those that came together and they had all things common. So in other words, again, we're seeing that term common is the same a derivative root word of koinonia, which means that they shared in everything. They were there for one another, right? Understanding that they were their only basis of support. 
your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, uh, your friends, your neighbors, things of that nature that you were all once uh, connected with when they took on uh, this Christian faith, a lot of those relationships were severed. And is that any different for those of us that uh, are embracing Christ today? When you think about it, right, when you think about the gospel being preached to the community of the unchurched and the non-believers, those that embrace it and accept it many times are walking away from life as they knew it. They're walking away from their circle of friends because they don't have those things in common, right? The party style, the lifestyle, the, the drinking, the, the illicit activities are no longer what they're associated with. And so many times the friends that they had that they used to do that with, they don't have those friends any longer. The conversations that they used to uh, fill and occupy their times with are not the conversations that they want to have and are having anymore today. Day, right? Uh, and many times they just no longer fit. They're having a hard time relating to those that were a part of their circles before. And as a church, we have to stand at the ready uh, to embrace and receive those individuals, welcome them into our lives, welcome them into our homes, embrace them, make them a part of our broader Christian community. Amen. They're walking away from something and we need to be ready to receive them so that they can walk into something. This is a part of that koinonia. This is a part of that community. This is a part of that having all things common, right? We need to give them something to do on Friday night because what they used to do on Friday night and the people they used to do it with, they're disconnected from. So now what are they doing on Friday nights? It's, 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 it's up to us to give them something to do on those Friday nights, right? Uh, we need to give them something for them to, to share text messages with and to, to friend and follow on social media and so on and so forth, right? And, and this is something that the early church did willingly, not because somebody twisted their arm, not because they were forced to, not because they were trying to get some kind of recognition, but, but it was because they just understood and appreciated you know, what it meant to be Christian at that time, and they wanted to bring everyone together. And, and so it's no wonder that with that mindset, with that attitude and that approach, you saw so many great things happening in the first century church. And, and again, I don't want to pretend that everything was perfect because it wasn't, but you can get a sense for the environment uh, that was present and prevalent in that first century church. And, and that's what I'm looking forward to uh, creating through our ministry here at GTAM. Uh, we're going to continue on, right? They had all things common. Look at verse number 45. They had so many things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. I mean, that is the ultimate of community. What I have, I'm willing to share with those that are a part of the church because you know what? If I've got it, you've got it. And if, if you need it and I've got it, hey, I'm going to give it to you because I understand we, we are like family now. Amen. And it says in verse number 46, and they continuing daily with one accord. Again, you'll see that that one accord coming in again, speaking about how unified, how together they were, right? They continued daily with one accord in the temple. So again, I mentioned it to you earlier, right? And again, the early church was made up almost exclusively of, of Jewish or Hebrew uh, converts, right? So, so they maintained their same traditional uh, temple worship while at the same time working and operating in the context of this new church that was being stood up by the disciples of Christ. So they continued uh, in the temple, but they also continued breaking bread from house to house. So again, this is what I referred to earlier. This breaking of bread is slightly different, although it's very similar. Uh, and in some places it is used to represent the Lord's Supper. In this context is being spoken to specifically of a type of bread, right? A, a really flat, almost cracker type of bread that was commonly consumed uh, as a part of meals uh, in the culture of that day. So it's talking specifically about, hey, we went to each other's house 
house and we shared a meal. We had dinner with one another, right? And, and so, again, this was common in those days of the early church, that they didn't just get together uh, in the temple, right? Because, again, that, that was a part of their traditional uh, approach to church. They got together not only in the temple, but from house to house. And when they got together from house to house, you would again see them sharing meals with one another. And that was the environment many times that the apostles doctrine would be taught. The family would gather together. Friends would gather together. Those that were a part of that local church community would gather together. And usually uh, an evangelist or a pastor, a teacher, right, a visiting missionary, one of the foundational apostles, someone who was an elder statesperson in the church would sit down and share and teach and impart while they were enjoying a meal with one another. They would sometimes pray with one another, pray for one another in each other's homes. And and that was foundational in the early church. They broke bread. They shared meals from house to house. What would that look like for us today in 2020, right? As we're uh, early into the 21st century, what does that look like today, right? We might be at each other's house in the summertime, you know, at a backyard barbecue, or you might invite some people over to your home and, and, and have breakfast or brunch or something of that nature. But when you get together, you all get together and, and you're breaking bread, sharing in a meal, but you're also going over the word of God. You're teaching and instructing uh, someone on the truth. There's someone that's got some seasoning, some maturity. One of the fivefold ministry that we're going to talk about in the future uh, service on the church, you know, uh, is there, you know, teaching and imparting and you're praying for one another. You're hearing about each other's stories and each other's challenges and you're there to support and impart to one another. You're you're going from house to house, breaking bread. It's, it's not me always going to, to your house but it's me going to your house, you coming to my house and us going to somebody else's house. It was it was that thing of community, right? It, 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 and it was mutual. And, and that was the culture and the heart, the spirit, the attitude that embodied the first century church. They went uh, from house to house, breaking bread. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So again, when they got together, again, it was for one mind. It was for one purpose. They they did it with gladness. They, they, it wasn't with strife and beef and things of that nature. You, you could see just how much joy and enthusiasm and love and satisfaction there was in that first century church. And, and, and I long to see that or more of that uh, through our churches today, where, where that spirit of the first century church, right, uh, permeates and goes beyond just what we see on Sunday morning, but it it, it, it exists in the homes that, that we're gathering together in uh, as well. And again, the chapter closes, verse number 47 says, uh, okay, again, so they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, Right. And so when they were house to house, they were breaking bread. They were eating their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were praising God. And, and, and this is something that I really want us to grasp and understand. We don't have to wait until Sunday morning to praise God. Can I get a witness? Right. In our homes, we can praise God. In our homes, we can celebrate and rejoice. In our homes, we can uh, uh, share the goodness and the exploits, the great things that God is doing. In our homes, we can uh, shout and dance and sing and clap. In our homes, we can share testimonies with one another about what God has done and just how wonderful and fantastic God has been and how much we value and love and appreciate him. We can share that with our family, with our spouses, with our children. We can share that with other believers that we come into a fellowship with. We can share that with the unbelievers and the unchurched that we invite into our homes to be a part of our fellowships and our 
our gatherings so that they can see the joy and the excitement and the enthusiasm that we genuinely, sincerely, authentically, organically have for God and that it might just prick their heart. Is it going to prick everyone's heart? No, but we can we have the opportunity to perhaps share our experiences with someone else. I, I want us to be the church, the type of church, right? And when I say that, I'm not just talking about GTAM. I'm talking about the broader church community. I want us to be that kind of church that others see and want to be a part of. I want to have a part of that fellowship. I want to have that kind of joy. I want to share in those kind of testimonies. I want to help out other people that, that I can utilize my skills and my resources to benefit, right? Uh, and, 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 and so we can do those things. We can do all of these things in our homes. We can do them very simplistically. We don't have to have anything super sophisticated or super complicated or super fancy. As long as we are genuine and sincere uh, in our hearts and what we are doing, we can create these environments in our homes. We can be like Cornelius and have an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in our homes. We can baptize people in our homes. It doesn't have to just be when we come together in, in a 21st century version of the temple in our services on Sunday morning. And, and I long to see more of that happening in our churches. Praising God, having favor with all the people. And watch this. It was in that environment, right, that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, right? It wasn't just about uh, attendance. It wasn't just about membership. It wasn't just about numbers, but it was the Lord adding to the community of those who answered his call. He added to them daily such as should be saved, right? We don't have to just wait. And that's so at, at, at GTAM, um, you know, we talk about uh, baptism, right? And, and when are baptisms performed? And, and we say, you know, we'll baptize you whenever you're ready. Uh, we euphemistically say when you're dead, we'll bury you, right? And, and so when you die out to yourself and you're ready to walk in the newness of life and embrace uh, Christ as as the head of your life, as your Lord and Savior, and, and you're ready to be discipled and, and to walk in his ways. When you're ready for that, so are we. That happens daily. Uh, you don't have to wait until Sunday to be baptized. You don't have to wait until a particular service or a particular you know, uh, Sunday of the month, right? Whenever you're ready, right? Here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? All you need is water and a willing soul and we can baptize you, right? And so the Lord, uh, again, this is the simplicity of it, right? You don't have to have special garments. You don't have to have a special tub. You don't have to have a special service. You don't have to have some kind of special uh, oil or anything of that nature, right? You no, know, you don't need all that. All you need is water and a willing soul. I love the simplicity of the early church. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, right? The Ethiopian eunuch later on in the book of Acts, when, when he got the revelation of, of who Jesus Christ was uh, and he was ready to, to be baptized, he turned to, uh, 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 to Philip and said, here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? And he pointed to a river. And he says, nothing. You know, if you're ready, if you believe you can be baptized, he said, I'm ready. I believe. And they went down to the river and got baptized right then and there. They say, OK, well, let's make an appointment. Let's come back on another day. We need to make sure that we gather all of your family and friends and we do all this other stuff. You have to have a hat and a cap. So you hear it wasn't any of that stuff. It was here's water. I'm ready. Let's go ahead and get baptized. I love the simplicity. Amen. And the genuineness, the authenticity of the first century church. And I believe that a lot of that was born out of the fact that these people were ready. They gladly received his word. They didn't have to be convinced. They didn't have to be sold, right? The message was presented in a way that was compelling and pricked their heart. And as a result of that, they gladly received it and were ready to walk into it. Amen. And, and as we come out of this 
uh, COVID-19 time of, of separation, I am enthusiastic and committed to returning GTAM to the simplicity of the early church. There are going to be some things that we're working on that I'm excited to, to, to share with you all in the coming weeks that I believe is going to help create an environment that is much more aligned with how the first century church was and, and, and remove some of the unnecessary complexity uh, that, that we may find in our own service experience so that we can too see signs and wonders and, and the great move and outpouring of the Lord. Wouldn't you love to come to GTAM uh, one Sunday morning and, you know, there's 120 of us there and, and the Lord miraculously adds 3,000. Not just so that we can say we packed out and had 3,000, but that's 3,000 more people who are destined for an eternity with God. Doesn't that just sound wonderful? And I believe that we're going to have that experience in our generation, in our day. Amen. And, and so, again, I, I pray that especially uh, in this time in human history that we are living in, um, that you uh, share the same burden and passion that I have, that, that, that let the church be the church again. Let us understand. Let us be uh, discipled and talk. Let us receive the apostles' doctrine on what the church is and how the church is supposed to function so that we too can present that gospel, that good news to the world that we live in today. And let us see a radical transformation of the hearts and the minds of people. I want to see people repent and turn away from their prior lifestyles, their prior attitudes, their prior mindsets, their prior behaviors, their prior biases, and turn to God with a purity and sincerity, an openness, a readiness to receive everything that God has for them. And, 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 and if that's your uh, desire as well, I welcome you to be a part of Grace and Truth Apostolic Ministries, whether that's in person or virtually, right? I welcome you. If you are gladly receiving this, if, if this is resonating with you, amen, if, if you are a part of that crowd and, and, and you are gladly receiving this word and you are singleness of heart and mind, if, if you are in one accord with us on this, I invite you to, to be a part of our community, be a part of our koinonia. Amen. We will gladly baptize you in its simplest form. All we need is water. Amen. And we will gladly baptize you in Jesus name. You can receive the Holy Spirit in your home. It doesn't have to be at the church. Amen. You can receive the Holy Spirit in your home, whether that's with someone laying hands on you or it may fall on you right now while I'm still speaking these words. If you have the unction to speak in those other tongues, let them flow. Let them just come pouring out of your belly like that river of living water uh, that was spoken of uh, by Christ in John's gospel. Amen. You can receive the Holy Spirit right then and there. Amen. I just, I just am so excited and am looking forward to seeing what God is going to do in the lives of his people as we learn and walk in the truth of God's word. Amen. I'm going to invite you to join me uh, in a word of prayer today uh, as we close out this service. And again, uh, please reach out to us. If whatever your prayer desire is, reach out to us. Whatever your ministerial need is, reach out to us uh, and, and let us see how we can uh, minister effectively to you in the way God would want us to. All right. Join us in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for what you have shared with us and for this insight. Oh God, there is something stirring within me, a joy and enthusiasm for what I believe is on the horizon of what you are going to allow us to walk into. Lord, I'm looking forward to that day uh, that we are all walking uh, in one accord, that we are of the same mind, that we have all things common, Lord, that we have singleness of heart. Uh, I'm looking forward to those who uh, are, are, are readily upset, uh, receptive and, 
and that have that reverence and that appreciation for your word, for for being disciple, that it, that they are ready to be taught, that they are ready to be poured into, they are ready to be developed and 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 mentored and and and, and joining in fellowship in each other's company and and being willing to open up their their homes and their lives to one another and. And Lord, for us to continue to participate and, and perform those sacred uh, rites of the church and for us to, to grow strong in our own personal prayer lives and for that to be reflective in the prayer that we uh, share when we come together as a community and a body of believers. Lord, I'm just looking forward to the manifestation of the church in this day, in the 21st century, in 2020, Lord, I'm looking for a contemporary modern expression of that first century church and just so glad that you have called us to be a part of it. I pray that you will reach out uh, into every home of everyone that is watching this broadcast right now. I pray that you would touch them with your spirit. For those who have not had the full impartation of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that you will pour it out upon them right now and that they would be filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of the Lord gives them the utterance. For those that have not been baptized in your name, Lord, I pray that they're receptive, that they'll reach out to us and they'll be uh, ready to partake uh, in that sacrament and that sacred uh, rite of the church. So we bless you. We love you, Lord. Uh, look forward to our continued growth, not only as a body, uh, but as individuals in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, we say amen. God bless you. I love you so much. I'm looking forward uh, to seeing you grow and what God is going to produce in your life and looking forward to seeing what God has in store for us as a collective body as well. All right. God bless you uh, and enjoy the rest of your uh, Sunday afternoon. Wow. Really, really uh, good message. Um, took me back. Hmm. Took me back when, uh, when I first received. It yeah. reminded me of... Uh, you know, just the love that we received from those that were at the church mm -hmm. and being invited over to eat and, um, you know, just being overshadowed with God's love through his people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a blessing. And then I remember the excitement too, right. you know, when we first received the Holy Spirit, oh, yeah. just that excitement, wanted to go and tell it everywhere, <laughs> you know, share it with our families and so on and so forth. Wanted, wanted everybody to feel what we felt, right. you know, because it was life, life giving and life changing. Um, the message when you were talking about um, just how the church was and mm -hmm. uh, simplicity, you mm -hmm. know, that that word really stood out right. and it's liberating um, when you think in terms of you know, just not having to have all of the, the stuff. Right. And what came to me was uh, when we overcomplicate things, mm -hmm. uh, we can we can miss God in it. Yep. You know, because there's so much uh, we miss the, the simplicity of what God is trying to reveal. Right. When we're moving so fast. That's the other thing. It's like moving so fast. Uh, we miss... Um, we miss those those scenic, those beautiful scenic routes because <laughs> mm -hmm. we're, we're traveling so fast, you know, trying right. to get to our destination. So um, I, I am excited about where God is taking uh, the church. Yes. Uh, for those that have ears to hear uh, what he's speaking to the churches. And I believe he's pleased with uh, where we're going. No, I, I, I certainly agree. You know, um, it's funny that you mentioned, you know, when we first got into the church, right? Because mm -hmm. cause that was us. We were living a totally different lifestyle, right? right? When we came into the church and all of our friends uh, were a part of that unchurched, yes. you know, community. And yes. so when we uh, got saved and wanted to turn our lives around, mm -hmm. we, we didn't know anybody, right? right? And so we were like these outsiders and, and thank God for those individuals that made us insiders and yes. brought us into their circles, introduced us to their, you know, Christian friends and allowed us to hang out with them yes. and, and do things with them. Right. And a lot <laughs> of those relationships remain to this day. Exactly. Right. Because of that. And, and you know, mom and pops medley, yes. you know, adopting <laughs> us as their spiritual children and, exactly. and teaching us so many things about what it's like to be 
you know, a Christian, you yes. know, husband and wife and and minister and yes. you know, and father and all that kind of good stuff. The Patmans, the Trouts, yes. you know, just so the Pharaohs, the Pharaoh, <laughs> yeah. so many, right? Yes. And and again, that was that concept of koinonia, right? right. And, and uh, sometimes it's finding an excuse to go over to their house, right? Hey, right. you need your yard cut or whatever, just because we wanted to be in that fellowship and company sure. and Something always cooking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and you know, I I believe that uh, uh, we're we're going to uh, experience more of that, right? Mm-hmm. I believe we do have a lot of that, you know, at G Tam, but I I believe that we're going to see more of that, right? Um, as we come out of this, uh, you know, time of separation because of COVID, I, th- I think we're going to see more of that. And yes. I think the church is going to be healthier I believe so. uh, and stronger and, and flourish, you know, as a result. And, and yeah, not, not overcomplicating not things. So I'm, I'm really yeah. looking forward exactly. uh, to it. So The soul, too. Um, you know, when we first came to the Lord, a lot of our, a lot of our friends... They didn't want you mentioned that, you know, some are going to want it. And I remember us trying to, you know, (laughs) trying to entice them, you know, to to come, but they didn't want it. And so, yeah, we didn't have any hardly any of our old friends. So Mm -hmm. that was important, you know, to be uh, befriended, you know, with Mm -hmm. those that were in the church. So keeping that at the forefront of our mind. Yeah, I mean, we were shunned, literally. I mean, some of our old friends (laughs) were like, I don't want to deal with you. Oh, you a holier than now? Get out of here. You messing it up. I can't even enjoy, you know. get my drink on. Yeah, with you around. You make, you know, so, so yeah, no, that was good. So, yeah. So I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I think it's important for us to understand some of those foundational elements of what the church is all about. And and as a matter of fact, to that end, Mm -hmm. uh, something that I'm uh, planning to do this coming week, I want you to come back here to our YouTube channel uh, as I'll be posting Monday through Thursday, a little bit more expansive um, application of those four different elements that we talked about from Acts, the second chapter and the 42nd verse, right? Mm -hmm. So the Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, Breaking Up Bread, Mm -hmm. and... um, um, prayers. I, I just want to expand on each one of those individually uh, to, to give some more uh, background and context in a contemporary setting. So yes. some examples of, of what does that look like, you know, for us today. So so come back, you know, each day and there'll be a short uh, video posted there awesome. uh, for you on that. So, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I guess that I guess we should um, shift. <laughs> yeah. You know, shift. yeah. Go ahead and uh, our, Kingdom's, our Kingdom's Kids, Kids right? At, at 12. At 12 noon. There were a few uh, complications last week, uh, but prayerfully this Sunday you will be able to uh, definitely um, connect. Uh, go to our website, www.apostolicdoctrine.com, and it should work this time. In Jesus' name. <laughs> and uh, get your kids connected. Amen. And uh, again, stay tuned. Uh, We are going to have some information to share here, uh, probably in this coming week or two, on what the next steps are going to be for us uh, to start our assembling and coming together again. That koinonia, right? We've been continuing uh, in the Apostles' Doctrine through this virtual uh, platform, right? So we can continue to share, teach, and instruct uh, the koinonia has really uh, been missing, uh, and so looking forward to being able to have the koinonia and, and the fellowship. Amen. And uh, so again, just stay tuned. A lot more on that coming up here in the next week or two. And again, just want to thank everybody for yes. your continued faithfulness, your steadfastness, right? And uh, even as a part of our community, how you all continue to, to give. Uh, contributing your tithes and your offerings, Mm -hmm. contributions to our capital campaign. We're seeing the fruit of that. Uh, uh, We're still working on things. So when we come back together again, we have a beautiful place to worship. So I just appreciate you all doing that and continue uh, to provide that support. We still need uh, some more help in this technology arena. So we haven't forgotten about that. Uh, If you have the ability, uh, you want to come and be a part of this community and and share your resources, right? It's a part of the community. Mm -hmm. You want to share your resources, your skills, your connections, whatever, uh, to help us with this broadcast. Uh, platform that is much needed and well appreciated. So, 
Happy Father's Day <laughs> to all of you fathers out there. And of course, my uh, wonderful husband has been an amazing father of seven beautiful children. And I'm just um, blessed to partner with you. Um, yes. So you've been you've been an awesome father. So I get to be spoiled today. Oh, you're going to get spoiled. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm, look, I'm looking forward <laughs> to getting spoiled, y'all. Love, 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 love. Yes. Lo love me. Yes. Yes. You're easy to love. It's oh. so easy to love you. <laughs> oh, so easy to love you. Amen. So easy to love you. <laughs> Because, no, okay, let me stop. It's okay, honey, it's okay. All right, God, God bless, bless you. you all. And uh, don't forget, uh, make it a lifestyle. Pray, right? Yes. Prayer, praise. That's and right. Just love God uh, wherever you are. At home. Yes. As well as at the church. All right, God bless you. See you Jesus. next time. <laughs>